I'm Sarah Browning. Um, I'm with the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, and I've been with the Extension for about 24 years now. I started off my career in Fremont in Dodge County, which we were talking about as we were uh, signing on tonight. And I've been in Lincoln now in the Lancaster office, though, uh, for about the last 12 years. So um, I'm a wow. certified arborist with International Society of Arboriculture, and um, really happy to be here with everyone tonight to talk about trees. So, all right. So we were going to start off, yeah, we were going to start off and talk about just, um, um, and, and, and um, Kaylin and Bob, the way the things are coming up on my screens, I can't look at our outline as I go through this. So okay. we were going to talk in our opening about um, what got us influenced in, into this career, what, what kind of trees were, um, were influential in getting us into our careers. So does anybody want to jump into that one? I'm sorry, what, what kind of, tree, what type of trees got us interested? Yeah, in I, think was, I think the initial question that um, uh, they had asked us to address was just, what, what was it about trees that got us interested in our careers? Yeah, you know, and again, me hanging out in nature a lot and just, uh, you know, being around trees a lot. We had a, a nice, uh, I guess with Nebraska, we call it a crick, right? Rather than a creek. <laughs> That's a Nebraska thing, isn't it? But uh, hanging out there in the woods a lot, uh, you know, foraging for mushrooms as a kid, uh, just, and my brother was kind of uh, a tree nerd growing up. We'd drive around town and he would rattle off the names of trees. And he'd be like, I bet you don't know the name of that tree. And he'd rattle it off and I'd be kind of like shrug my shoulders. I'm like, who cares? Right. And now it's kind of come full circle. He still lives in Dodge and takes care of the park and Dodge and takes care of trees. And, and uh, when I go home, like for the holidays and whatnot, we always have to do our tree walkabout and see what trees he's planted. So I've always been just a, a plant nerd in general, but have a real affinity towards trees for their longevity. And, you know, this picture kind of says it all, what neighborhood would you rather, rather live in? Right. And I would rather live in one that has, uh, tree lined streets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. How yeah, about I you, think, Yeah, I think for me, again, like my cottonwood story, growing up in western Nebraska, I know there's someone out in Ogallala. There aren't a ton of trees out west, um, but when there are trees, it's like super impactful um, and really important. Um, I also grew up going to like 4 H camp in Halsey Forest, and I always thought that was amazing that there was just this forest that was never there before. Um, but yeah, no, I've just always loved nature. I feel like I grew up outside and yeah, I love trees. Yeah, wonderful. You know what, I, so I grew up in Omaha and um, I, I you know, was a kid during the seventies uh, watching all of the elm trees in Omaha dying from Dutch elm mm. disease. And I remember having that having such a big impact on me um, mostly when the trees were gone, because then I realized when they were gone, what a big impact they really made on those streets. Yeah. Um, and it was curious to me why so many were dying and then what was killing them. You know, it just, it just was a whole, uh, the whole situation was very interesting to me. And so I think maybe that may have been uh, part of the reason that I got interested in working with trees in my, in my career. I'm going to get interested and save those trees, didn't you, say? Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, um, so talking about the value of trees, you know, um, trees, trees have a lot of different um, impacts in our communities. And, um, uh, you know, Bob, if you want to take, take this one, we'll go ahead and let you do that. Yeah, you bet. You know, the, the, you know, obviously we know about benefits of trees, you know, and, and thankfully trees are getting the rightful benefit as wildlife habitat and biodiversity, because without trees, you guys, pollinators would be in serious trouble because when pollinators are first emerging early in the spring, there's very few flowers in bloom, but trees are in bloom. So without the trees, our pollinators and our, the biodiversity, we'd be doomed. So trees are critical to that wildlife habitat and biodiversity. Of course, we know they they cool our communities and, you know, tree planting used to be much, a much bigger thing back before everybody had an air conditioner, right? All you have to do is go to the older areas of, 
of your hometown in Lincoln specifically, the older neighborhoods have a lot more trees than the new developments. Well, those older neighborhoods that had the big porches and lots of trees is because your house was like a hot box, right? Because of, you know, no air conditioning. So people built these big, beautiful porches and, and trees were a big part of that uh, sheltering the community and, and saving money and, and cooling your home. And of course, stormwater benefits, stormwater is a big issue now. And, uh, you know, all you have to do is stand under the canopy of a mature tree during a rainstorm. And you know that, you know, the tree is, the, the, the canopy of that tree is slowing the water down and allowing it to, it to penetrate the soil rather than run off. And a lot more research is being done mainly at the University of Illinois on the mental and physical comfort trees provide us. So people are hearing more that a walk in the woods is important to us and just having nature around us is important to our, our, phys, our, our mental well-being as well as our physical well-being. So uh, tons of values. And of course, the increased property value, increased property values of neighborhoods. And it's, of course, they're just beautiful and inviting. Uh, make you know Towns, small towns, if you drive through Nebraska, if they have great trees, I think it's a place you want to live versus a place that has not so great trees, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just going hand in hand with that, Bob, um, you know, trees uh, can help us address some of these environmental and economic and social challenges, too. Um, exactly. Uh, Sarah, if you wanted to, you know, talk about this slide, uh, feel free and I'll just chime in or and Kayla can chime sure. in. Sure. We well, you know, so it is a problem. And I mean, kind of going along with the comments that I made about, you know, the trees dying in the 70s from Dutch elm disease, we, we seem to have had a series of, of, uh, of pests that have come in and have, you know, killed a lot of trees along with environmental um, uh, situations, um, drought specifically. But we had Dutch elm disease, we've had um, pine wilt, uh, we're, we're losing trees now to, to emerald ash borer. Um, we're seeing a lot of tree damage from Japanese beetles, but all of these things come together and we see a declining in our community forest, which makes a big impact on the livabil livability of those um, communities. Um, and plus, you know, uh, if, if we don't have trees that will um, support the habitat or provide the habitat that we need for those insects that Bob was mentioning, or for the birds or for the insects, um, we end up having, you know, kind of sterile landscapes where we, we really can't have a lot of um, biodiversity out there. Um, excessive water consumption can certainly be a problem if we're planting trees that are not well adapted. And we're going to talk a lot tonight about um, how to, to decide what trees are well adapted and, and how to um, choose a tree that will work well with the, the, the weather that we have in Nebraska. Um, as, as Bob mentioned, stormwater management issues are a problem. You know, as, as rain falls and it, it is filtered through a tree canopy, it can slow those raindrops down and it can help um, um, prevent, you know, um, excessive runoff. And if we don't have trees, then that, that can be a big issue. Yeah. Um, pesticide or fertilizer overuse um, is, is always an issue in urban areas. Um, oftentimes homeowners don't really understand the best ways to use these products. You know, they don't, they don't make the effort to identify a pest before they start to spray something and they may actually apply the wrong product that, that does not provide any control or they may fertilize too much, you know, which will result in nitrogen or phosphorus runoff, which, which causes problems with our surface water. Yeah. So those can be big issues as well. Um, we're going to be talking about threats from a change of climate here uh, in, a, in a few slides and um, how that impacts our environment and how that impacts our selection of trees. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, global challenges from invasive exotic pests is something that we're just, we seem to be feeling it more and more um, as our, our, um, our world is connected into a more global community. Unfortunately, some of these pests like emerald ash borer, you know, get brought in inadvertently and then we have difficulty controlling them. So um, yep. uh, our tree selection and the trees that we choose to plant um, is, a, is a big um, uh, factor in helping us uh, provide good biodiversity in our community forest so that our community forest can be resistant when we have pests like this coming in, okay? 
And then just, you know, the little, the young man there up in the top, up top of the screen. You know, some of our young folks are getting disconnected from nature, you know, being more um, uh, interested in playing video games and watching TV and things like that. Um, so just getting people outside more, enjoying nature, appreciating nature um, is definitely a good thing. No doubt. That always makes me sad to see how pretty that emerald ash borer bug is. It is. <laughs> you know, it is. It is a very pretty, pretty Why does insect. It have to be so terrible. But, right. Yeah. And but, we, uh, we're definitely um, dealing with that right now. Um, I'm sure everybody is and is aware of it. And we have an emerald ash borer recovery plan that we're um, removing and replacing ash on a one for one basis um, in parks and on streets. So this is something really important to us to provide trees that are similar in size. Um, I mean, you can't completely replace everything that the ash provided, but at least getting some diversity in and something similar in terms of growth. I bet, bet. definitely. Yeah. So maybe that's a good place to segue into the importance of native trees, because, you know, as we're replacing these trees that we have to, to remove because of the ash borer, the importance of native trees is, is an important aspect. Um, right. So Kayla and Bob, you guys want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'll start, you know, uh, native trees, you know, when, when we plant trees, folks, in communities, I would venture to guess that 99% of those trees that are being currently planted are either not native, or if they are native, the seed was not collected in Nebraska or in, in areas close to Nebraska. So I think for me, uh, the importance of native trees is just to get them out in our residential landscapes and planted. Um, they're overlooked and underutilized and, you know, and they're adapted to native soils and climate and obviously climate shifting a little bit, but if anything is going to be able to handle a, uh, you know, Nebraska, we have fast weather, right? Everybody knows that. And uh, if you live in Shadron or Valentine, your weather is supersonic, <laughs> right? Uh, or Ogallala, George. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, so, so if anything's going to be more adapted to that, it's our native trees. Um, and, and then once they're established, they require little, if any, supplemental irrigation. So that idea of overwatering our landscapes, you know, we can shut off the sprinkler system because these trees don't need it once they're established. Uh, they can make it on their own, uh, even when we have significant drought stretches. And they provide critical habitat for important wildlife and not just for squirrels, not just for songbirds eating the fruit, but for beneficial insects as well. Without trees, uh, many, many beneficial insects would not be available to us. And we'll talk about that as, as we move forward as well. Yeah. So I think one of the big questions they wanted us to answer tonight was what will be the trees of the future? You know, what trees should people be looking for to be planting in their landscapes? And Kaylin, you had this cute picture of the kids. Was this a yeah. planting project that you did? Yes. Yeah, so this was at uh, the future Jensen Park. It's kind of down by the YMCA in Southeast Lincoln. Um, this was an Arbor Day planting event with Arbor Day staff and they brought their their family there and I just I thought this picture was just so cool helped yeah. like these kids got to see like how to plant a tree and I think that's how you you know get kids excited about nature is you show them how to do it you have them do it and they they kind of develop a love for it yeah um, get them out there and get their hands dirty and they have fun yes. with that mm -hmm. yes absolutely yeah yeah, and I would venture to guess those Arbor Day plantings, when you drive home on Arbor Day, you'll see more people mowing their lawn than you will planting trees. The kids are the really, really the only group that celebrates Arbor Day, you know, because right. it's just kind of there with the school. So I, my dream is you drive home on Arbor Day and you actually see people planting trees rather than mowing the grass, right? Uh, yeah. We'll get there someday. Well, this but, yeah. year's, I think, the 150th anniversary for Arbor Day. So maybe this year's the year. Yay. That's right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and folks are probably hearing a lot about, you know, the value of planting trees to combat climate change, you know, and we should be planting trees anyway. But if anything is going to help uh, with uh, dealing with climate change, it's planting more trees. Uh, because again, we've kind of lost that connection to nature, not just the young people, but uh, our generation, generations older than us, you know, the best plant, the best time to plant a tree is yesterday, right? And so anyway, one thing this slide talks about is the provenance of tree seed. So where does that tree seed come from? 
and Provenance is basically where that tree grows naturally in nature. And we'll show some trees and, and where their natural range is, where they occur historically. And obviously with global planting, we plant trees all over the country, right? And they may not, they may be from China. Uh, they, they could be from Europe or they could be from North America or they could be from the Great Plains, right? And this is a quote from uh, Robert Call, Dr. Call, uh, wrote the book on, uh, he's a botanist, he's since passed away, uh, but uh, Bob Call uh, wrote the book on the floor of Nebraska. And this is a quote from him, many native tree species meet the natural limit of the range in Nebraska. So if you go, this is a cottonwood and a bur oak you're seeing here. And uh, this is a slide my cohort Justin provided to me, so I really appreciate this. Uh, it, and you may not know this, but hopefully you do, that we, Nebraska, you know, we sit kind of that ecological crossroads. The Missouri River region in the eastern part of the state is kind of where the deciduous forest of the east ends, right? And the, and the western part of the state where we have the Pine Ridge and, and um, the Panhandle area is where a lot of the western species uh, meet their range limit. So, and then you go up north with the Niobrara River Valley, and then you got things like ponderosa pine and yuccas and stuff that, you know, that meet their, their limit on that northern fringe. And same with the southern fringe, that's where our catalpa came from, for example, uh, is only native along the southern tier counties historically. But obviously we know catalpa has been planted all over Nebraska, but it only originated in those southern tier counties, Ohio buckeye. Uh, there's a subspecies that grows in the southeastern corner of the state, really only in three counties, Gage County and the Fairbury area on, on east to uh, Richardson County. And it's actually more closely related to what's called the Texas buckeye, which is a subspecies of the Ohio buckeye. And I've seen those trees in nature and I'm like going, why aren't we collecting seed from these trees to get these into our communities? So you can see 35 tree species reach their geographic range limit more than any other state. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. So here's a good example. This is limber pine. We only have two pine trees native to the state, the limber pine and the ponderosa. And if you look at this map, the, the, the green on this map represents where this tree is native. So you can see in the state of Colorado, it's native throughout up and north and south throughout the front range. But as you look where the very little southwestern corner of Nebraska uh, near the little town of Kimball is where uh, the limber pine pocket. So we can say it's native to Nebraska, but look at how native it is, right? <laughs> We're talking, you know, you know, not even five miles into the state and that's it. So when we yeah. say native, what does that mean, right? Because the limber pine is much more native to Denver than it'll ever be to Lincoln. Right. And then the ponderosa pine, as you see, kind of skirts the Niobrara Valley and then goes west towards northwest towards the Shadron area. All those, uh, that green line that you see there is the Pine Ridge. And then as you go further south in the Panhandle, you're seeing the Garing Scotts Bluff area or the Wildcat Hills. And they've actually done coordinating of those ponderosa pines in the Wildcat Hills. They're over 400 years old. Cool. Wow. Pretty cool. impressive. Here's a map of Kentucky coffee tree. Hopefully you folks are familiar with this native tree. But again, when people say native, it's really only native along the Missouri River region, as you can see, and then grows south into Kansas, Missouri. Heck, they should have called it the Missouri coffee tree rather than Kentucky, because as you can see, it's only native to the northern tier counties of Kentucky. So pretty interesting to find out where it's native to. And you can kind of see it follows the Mississippi River as well. Then this is black cherry, another native tree. This scene is repeated over and over again. I just wanted to show you some of the native species. And you can see black cherry only makes its way just into the very far eastern fringes of Nebraska, again, along the Missouri River. But we can take seed from these provenance. So where would we collect black cherry seed from? Well, obviously, we wouldn't go down to Mexico and collect it from there, right? Why not collect it from the fringes of its native range? What those those trees with their provenance where they're at the fringe of their native range, those are the most hardy, those are the most adaptable because they've kind of gone outside of their comfort zone. The middle of this range is probably the most comfortable area for these trees to grow like Indiana, Kentucky, uh, Ohio, but on the fringes of Nebraska, those are gonna be the most adaptable, tough tree species for the future. Mm -hmm. And then here's American sycamore, same thing. See how it ends right along the Missouri? That's it in the state, yet we call it a native tree. 
And, uh, you know, I was like going, come on, man, you got, that's not native to Nebraska. If you didn't have the Missouri River, well, plants don't know borders. Man drew those borders, right? And then finally, the bur oak, uh, you know, everybody should know the bur oak is our quintessential native tree of Nebraska and kind of the ground zero for bur oak countries, Illinois. But you can see where the bur oak actually has kind of extended a little further west into the central part of the state. You can see there's some, some dots in there in southwestern Nebraska and, and northwestern Kansas. Those little outlier populations, I think, house the seed sources of the future for climate change because we collect seed from a little area near McCook in Culbertson, Nebraska called Burrow Canyon. And I think that's going to be the burrow for the future as we can take it further west into in the front range of Colorado and Wyoming and, and down into New Mexico, Texas. This tree has proven hardy easily to find minus 40 ambient. So it's uh, a great seed source for our, for our plantings for the future. A lot of times people say, I don't have room for a bur oak. And I like the quote from a tree nerd that I've heard say, what's up there but sky anyway. <laughs> so so don't, be a, don't let that big tree scare you. And then what do we need when we say regionally native tree? And that's a tree that's not quite native to Nebraska. You can see where the sugar maple is native in our country. And if you look south into Kansas and the Missouri, uh, it kind of stretches just past Kansas City and the St. Joe area. And there it kind of stops. So that seed source is very important too on the fringes of its native range, right? And this picture you see here is from the little town of Table Rock, Nebraska. And that town is dotted with dozens and dozens of sugar maples, more sugar maples than we know of of any town in the state. And we're convinced that it was maybe some trees were taken off of a railroad line or whatever, uh, bare root seedlings from the state of Missouri and their conservation tree program. And if you look up into South Dakota and look in the very Northeast corner of South Dakota, do you see that little blip of the population there? That is a state park where the sugar maple doesn't get any further west in the world. And a tree researcher, Dr. John Ball has gotten that seed available uh, to people as well, because again, it's the outlier of that uh, native range of that tree. So it should be the toughest of the tough. And then here's another regionally native tree that's not quite native to Nebraska, but the pecan has certainly proven itself all over the state. I had somebody send me a picture of a northern pecan growing north of Blair. And this picture, uh, it's not this picture, this is actually on UNLE's campus, one of my favorite trees on campus, right there by the dairy store. If you ever go there, check out this tree, you'll be glad you did. But that tree north of Blair, this person sent me a picture of it, 60 foot high tree that's producing nuts and it's all by itself. It's not being pollinated by another tree and it's still producing nuts. It's not supposed to be able to do that. <laughs> it's supposed to have a pollinator. But what really struck me was, yeah, my dad planted this tree decades ago, got the seed from down in Houston. And there it is glowing, blow, growing north of uh, Blair for what, 60, 70 years. But you can wow. see the pecan is certainly native to Texas. Uh, so these are also areas we can grow trees from for trees of the future, because as our climate warms, our weather is going to be much more like Wichita, Kansas, right, uh, or Oklahoma. Uh, that's what we kind of expect our weather to be like in the future. So ice storms will certainly be an issue. Did I just say that? But yes, ice storms will be an issue. It's not if, it's when, folks, and it's, it's going to be a bad one. And what trees are we going to have that can withstand those ice storms? Well, it's trees from the Great Plains, right, from ice storm country like Oklahoma and Texas and Arkansas and Kansas and, of course, Nebraska. Right. So we're going to talk about um, growing trees a little bit later in our presentation tonight, but, but we do know that trees in urban areas have a lot of problems related to poor soils or the growing conditions that they are put into in our urban environment. And, and both the, these things can be worsened by climate change. Um, and we'll talk a little more specifically about climate change here in a little bit. Um, urban soils tend to be very highly disturbed. Um, they tend to be um, subsoil oftentimes, especially with new construction homes. Uh, the topsoil is removed and all the homeowner is left is with subsoil, which sometimes it does not have many nutrients in it. Um, and, you know, people don't think enough about soil and, and soil as the the bedrock really for a healthy tree because trees need to pull everything they need to grow from the soil. They need 
They need a good amount of soil for root production and for root growth. They need organic matter. They need good water drainage. They need nutrients available, nutrients to be available. So all of these things are dependent on soil quality and quantity. And oftentimes those are lacking in the urban environment uh, with our trees. Wow. So um, one question that we, we um, were asked to address tonight was, do some trees mitigate carbon dioxide better than others? Well, yes, actually they do. And here are some of the qualities that you wanna look for in a tree that is going to be able to sequester carbon dioxide better. Basically, we're looking at trees that live a long time, tr trees that get big. So an oak tree is gonna sequester carbon dioxide better than a crab apple. Um, we want something with a medium to a slow growth rate, higher tissue, tissue density. Of course, we need it to survive in an urban climate. So we need something that's pretty tolerant to the common urban stresses that we see in trees, just so the tree can survive uh, from year to year. Then another consideration is, okay, maybe your tree may be storing carbon dioxide, but if you're, if you're using fossil fuels to uh, blow the leaves away um, in the fall, in your, or you're doing that multiple times throughout the year, that, that uh, use of gasoline in that leaf blower is gonna offset the effects of the, the carbon sequestration that your tree is doing. So keep in mind that you need to use some low, low, um, low maintenance, uh, maintenance practices, not using fossil fuels to help um, boost that, that carbon dioxide sequestration. So just in general, when trees reach 12, 12 inches in circumference, uh, DBH, that's diameter at breast height, which is four and a half feet up the trunk from the ground, generally at that point, they are carbon neutral, okay? So just think about, you know, larger trees, long lifespan, slower growth rate, those are gonna be the trees that will sequester carbon the best. And if you wanna read up a little bit more on this specific topic, you can go to this publication, Effects of Urban Tree Management and Species Selection on Atmospheric Carbon. And you can find that at go.unl.edu slash CO2 mitigate. Don't bag your leaves. That'll help too. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So choosing trees. I think we all kind of wanted to chime in here on how to choose a good tree. And here we've got um, pictures of the most common production uh, uh, methods for trees or the ways that you can buy trees at nurseries and garden centers. We've got bald and burlap on the far left. We've got a large bare root tree in the center. And we used to have a, a nursery in um, Schuyler uh, that, um, and darn, I'm blanking on the name of that nursery, Bob. What yeah. was it? Yeah, Dublin Nursery. In fact, Dublin, Sarah, that's right. The, the picture you see is a former forester here, Chip Murrow, and he pulled, that's a gravel bed that you see those trees healed in. And uh, Jim is no longer with us, but you can see pulling out that bare root tree. That tree grew in that gravel. It had drip irrigation on it, but you see all the fine roots that that bare root tree grew in that gravel, highly oxygenated and happy, of course, pulling it out of that gravel, you got to keep those roots moist. And that's one of the issues with bare root. You generally not see them in nurseries anymore because of the, that handling issue. But, you know, if you order, a lot of times when you order your fruit trees, for example, they'll come still to you bare root, which is a, a good thing in getting them planted. There's there's certainly things you have to consider when you're planting bare roots. And one of them is you can see the trees, are, the roots are kind of dangling down due to gravity and tree roots mostly grow out, right? Not down. So you, you, you know, just putting it in a hole and having all those roots directed downward is, is not going to be good for that tree. And then containerized trees, somebody thought it was a good idea to stick a tree in a smooth sided container. If you would have asked the tree, it would have said, I don't think this is a very good idea because we have circling roots that happen. So the best thing you can do is, is pick the smallest tree in the largest container rather than the largest tree in the smallest container to help kind of uh, get past that, that circling root syndrome that we see happen. The reason trees were put in containers was not for the health of the tree. We can all probably guess the reason was it made them more transportable. Uh, you could pack many more trees on a semi than you could with a 300 pound root ball on, on a B and B tree. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the grow bags on the far right. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. We have um, some additional images to show you of, of using grow bags because there are some advantages to that. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
So just as Bob said, you know, select the smallest tree with the largest root ball available. Um, whenever I'm planting a tree, I like to plant it myself because then I know it's planted right. So that means I have to plant, I have to, I have to select something that's small enough for, for me to handle just on my own. Yep. Um, these would be too big for me to handle by myself. Right. Um, yep. So, but there, there definitely can be problems when you're planting a really large tree. Kaylin, you want to chime in on this? So these, I don't think anybody could handle by themselves unless <laughs> they have <laughs> lots of heavy machinery to help them. Um, so this is actually uh, from a project I did for my sister last fall. Um, she had found these trees, great deal. They were huge. So she's really excited. You know, I think there's sort of a draw to have the, the instant landscape effect. Um, and you don't get that necessarily when you plant a small tree, but I think there are pros and cons to both. Um, these trees had to be delivered and augered. So you can see on the right there, that's a, a machine doing an augering to dig the hole. Um, it, it's convenient and it's fast, but it's kind of hard to control the depth of how far you're, you're digging. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be a problem. You don't want to plant your trees too deep because um, they don't like that. Um, so like I said, these were planted in the fall. If you go to the next slide, um, this is the next spring. Um, two out of the three trees survived, but that middle one right in the middle of the landscape died. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's like, dang it. Um, but yeah, I was actually going to send this to Backyard Farmer too, because I, yes. I, I don't know what happened, but the more I thought about it, I was like, it probably got transplant shock, you know, with yeah, how big yeah. of a tree it was. They probably dug it out with a tree spade and it probably just well, those, those, those root balls, especially the one, it seems like the one on the very back end of the trailer didn't have that big of a root ball to it compared right. to the size of the tree. So right. mm -hmm. there may have just not been enough roots for that tree to reestablish well. Exactly. And exactly. Yep. So yeah. again, I think when you're picking trees, make sure that you're considering um, size. I, I like what Sarah and Bob said, pick something that you can plant yourself and plant it yourself. So you know um, exactly what, what you're working with. Um, and yeah, the best time to plant a tree was probably yesterday or 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. you just got to be patient. I think you get more long-term reward if you start with smaller trees, it'll live longer. Um, yeah, and have better sure. success. For yeah. sure. You know, containerized trees here have become the most common. And, and oftentimes, like you were saying, Kaylin, man, I got a heck of a deal, right? I, I bought this tree for 20 bucks. And so then if you're trying to sell a tree that you, that's grown well for anything higher, they think you're trying to rip them off because, you know, I was able to get this tree at, at Shopco for 20 bucks, right? And it was it was 10 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you remember that picture from Jim Cook's Dublin Nursery of that bear root tree, and the size of that bare root tree, imagine stuffing that big root system in this pot and saying, oh, it's kind of a disservice to those trees. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just would be hard pressed to plant any of those. Yeah, there you see the size, you know, basically similar in size to what you just saw in those containers and look at the size of that root bowl. So how do you stuff all of that in that little pot without there being problems with it circling out because you can see the roots grow out horizontally from the tree. 90% of the roots are in the top 18 inches of soil. They don't grow down like a carrot, you know? Right, right. We see a lot of people, you know, using bald and burlap trees, especially if they want to try to get a bigger tree in the landscape. And there, there are problems to bald and burlap trees though too, because they lose like, you know, like we show here in the slide, 95% of their root system is cut off when those trees are dug out of the field. Yep. So uh, that's a lot of the recovery time for that tree to um, get reestablished in the landscape. Um, you know, so uh, at least 12 inch root ball for every inch of trunk diameter. Um, and then for every inch of trunk diameter, we, we, the rule of thumb is it'll take about a year or at least a year for that tree to recover. Right. Um, so it's, you know, people think of Alden Burlap is the way to go. It's kind of that instant tree effect, like you mentioned, um, Kaylin, but these trees need TLC, you know, to get them going again, because they lose so much of their root system in the digging process. Amen. I, for me, for bald and Burlap, I like to say, try to go no lar larger than a one inch caliper. And a lot of times trees that are specced for projects, 
it's two inch caliper at the minimum because they, they, they're they fearful of a one inch caliper that will catch that two inch caliper in a season. And uh, I asked Dr. John Ball that gave a talk once that that study that, that determined for every one inch tree diameter it will take a year to recover the root system. That was done under the best of conditions. So if we, and it was only one study. So how can we base our, our decisions on one measly study, right? Yeah. And, and besides it was done in great parent soil. So if you're planting a two inch caliper tree in, in poor urban soil that's poorly drained, maybe all the top soil was removed and you just have subsoil, you could probably triple that number. Meaning if you're planting a two inch caliper tree in a parking lot and surrounding it in one of those parking islands and surrounding it with river rock, my assumption would be triple that number and how long it will take to recover that root system if it ever does. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so to address a lot of these root problems that we have in our production systems with um, bald and burlap trees losing so many roots in the digging, containerized trees having problems with girdling roots uh, from those smooth sided containers, there has been a lot of technology and a lot of research done in recent years on newer types of containers that can produce a better root system a more fibrous root system without those circling roots. Um, and so here you're seeing some different examples of different types of containers and grow bags that, that you may see in the nurseries and garden centers, hopefully more and more in years to come. Um, these are the, the types of um, changes in production methods that we would like to see to eliminate some of these root issues that we find are so common um, in, uh, in any type of garden center tree. Amen, Sarah. That that one on the left is uh, a knit fabric bag that is designed to be in ground, in other words. So you see the roots coming out of that bag that have been constricted, and those roots just kind of pop right off. And then on the inside of that bag, uh, the root has already kind of uh, calloused itself, so it doesn't have to, to heal a wound as you would do when you're cutting a root and in putting it in a bald and burlap, these roots have already calloused. They're ready to grow new roots once you remove that bag and take those outside roots off. Those outside roots are providing water to that tree, but all the carbohydrates are staying inside that bag. It's a really cool thing. And the middle one is called a root trapper bag. And the guy that invented this stuff has like 26 patents. He, he's, he's brilliant. And kudos to him for making it a white container because those, those black plastic pots uh, sitting out on a parking lot, uh, being sold to you. The, if you put a, a thermometer in that pot, you know the, the side facing the sun can you know rise up up to you know 150 degrees, killing those roots. So white bag keeps the the root system much cooler, and those are designed above ground for more for the retail sale. And then the, the containers on the right. Uh, use air pruning. So when the roots uh, start to grow through those openings in the containers, whether it's in those slits on the sides or the ridges in the containers you see on the bottom, the roots, the roots stop growing when they hit the air. And so the roots behind the root tip, then the root just branches out and it becomes more fibrous, but it, it tends to stop the roots from circling the way that they do in, um, in smooth sided round containers. Okay. No doubt. Um, and so that's what we were talk, just talking about here uh, about the root pruning. Yep. So here are some pictures. Um, go ahead, Bob. This is your picture from Great Plains yeah. Nursery. Yeah, Great Plains Nursery uh, listened to the research, believed in the research, and, and they're, one, they're really the only grower in the state, probably the region, that is collecting seed from local native populations. And if they're not hitting it from a local native population, they're collecting it from a tree that has stood the test of time, i.e. a mature tree that has seen the rigors of Nebraska. And they're growing everything in these air pruning containers. If we looked at the, the, the ridges on the side of these pots, these ridges have holes all the way along them. And again, the roots are kind of directed towards those holes. And then they meet that hole. And as Sarah said, that root tip can't grow anymore. So you can see where those roots are kind of ending and growing down along that slit. That's where uh, a hole was in that pot. So you don't see circling roots in this container. And this is probably a, a contalpa because they have white roots and it's easy to photograph the roots. You can't see them as easily like an oak, for example, but a really good image showing you uh, how this does a great job of preventing circling roots. Definitely. And what the root trapper does is those roots grow out 
uh, from, uh, from the main stem and reach the sides of this container. On the inside of the container, it's much like landscape fabric. And this uh, Dr. Whitcomb uh, discovered quite by accident that if the root gets caught up in this fiber, it can't, it can't circle the pot. It basically gets trapped. And uh, that also forces branching behind that root tip. So these do a great job of also preventing uh, that circling root. But it has to start from a young tree. You can't just stick in a tree that already has root defects and hope a root trap or container is going to fix that. It has to start from seed. And that's what Great Plains Nursery is doing is growing these up in these containers from seed. So uh, a great place to get trees. Uh, and they're uh, just north of Valparaiso. You can find them online. They're just good people. So we would really encourage you to look for some of these alternative production technologies when you're buying trees. The air pruning containers, the root bags, um, uh, all those types of things, because you'll end up with a better root system, which will give you the chance of having a much healthier tree once you get it planted in your landscape. And Sarah, if you'd back up real quick once, Notice folks, these trees aren't pruned up to, to so-called look like a tree in the nursery. They're keeping the lower branches on as long as they can. That Whitcomb did research and kind of traced where the, the, the sugars and the carbohydrates, of, of where is that going? It's not going back into the root system from the tops of the trees, it's staying up in the branches. The only things that are contributing to a developing root system are those lower branches on trees. So they'll leave those lower branches and it'll help build caliper or thickness, so you don't have this tall, skinny tree. You have more like a, a shorter, or I shouldn't call it shorter, but a more of a stout tree that can handle the rigors of the Great Plains winds. Right, right. Yes. And if you trim it too early, once it grows, it'll look very strange. Right. Like and a, a lollipop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I know I saw a chat pop up asking about um, uh, ash tree replacement tree. So this kind of loops into it. We have um, a recommended street tree list on the city of Lincoln's website. And um, if you flip to the next slide, Sarah, it kind of talks about um, kind of how we have it categorized. Uh, we developed this with our, with our Lincoln Parks and Rec Department um, with community forestry and with approval from our community forestry advisory board, which I will chime in too. We are looking for a new member. So anybody who loves trees and Lincoln look it up, Community Forestry Advisory Board, we need a new member. But um, anyway, back to this tree list. Um, we have this sort of categorized on what's gonna live here, especially on our streets. Um, like we talked about earlier, um, we picked out streets or trees that are acclimated to um, withstand the abuse, <laughs> I guess I would say, of you know the sort of harsh climate that uh, bad soil, um, not usually the best amount of space, um, and also only deciduous, so things that can get high and off the ground. Um, I don't know if you've driven around Lincoln and you've seen um, the perfect square cut out from the trees where the semis have to drive through. Um, so we try to help um, the public understand sort of the tree shape and size is categorized by large, medium, and small. Um, and we also have it categorized by um, kind of what we what Bob touched on earlier, uh, what's native to Nebraska, so quote unquote native or native VAR is what we call it, um, what's U.S. native and then what's not native, so could have had a source from China or somewhere else outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. these street trees. It's a great list. Yeah, thank you. you know what? It's amazing, um, Bob and Kaylin. It's already eight seven forty eight, and we're not even halfway through our presentation. So we're going to pick up the pace here a little yes. bit, I guess. <laughs> we will go. I knew that was so, going to happen. Yeah. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship between trees and 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 you know insects, birds, and other wildlife. You and bet. so I'll let you take this, Bob. Yeah. You know, and and uh, you saw on that previous slide that. You know, all we, you know, even if you, you plant some native trees, you know, uh, native woody plants support 14 times as many insect species as introduced ornamental plants. You say, well, why do we need more insects? Well, that's, that's a part of the web. Without insects, we're doomed. And just even the cottonwood, if you've ever noticed a cottonwood branch falling in the spring, late winter, as the buds are starting to swell, they have these huge buds on them, and they're kind of sticky. They have a resin on them. 
And, and if, uh, bees, when they're emerging, whether it be a native bee or honeybees, uh, because there's poplars or, or cottonwoods that grow in Europe where the honeybee is native, right? Uh, the bees will actually collect this resin and uh, it's called propolis. And they'll, they'll actually uh, stick that glue on their hives. It has antimicrobial and antifungal properties to it. So it's a very important uh, early food source for the bees uh, as they're emerging in the spring. And then our early blooming trees, oftentimes we don't notice these because the flowers are so small, but maybe you've noticed a red maple, how the whole tree is just kind of have these little red buds on them early in the spring, at least we think they're buds, but you walk up close to that maple and those tiny little flowers are very important for bees as they're emerging in the spring. And you can kind of see the most valuable ones, maples, elms, red buds, buckeyes, crab apples, service berries, our choke cherries and black cherries uh, are important. Um, all of those uh, very important to our bees as they're emerging in the spring. And then you can see some of the trees there that are native trees that, uh, again, invite a plethora of insects, even trees like Kentucky coffee tree. You don't notice the flowers so much, we as humans, but boy, the bees sure do. And then even the catkin flowers, uh, oak trees have catkins. Uh, this is a honey locust tree. You can often smell a honey locust before you can see the flowers. Maybe you've noticed that, that delightfully sweet smell as you walk under a honey locust when it's in full bloom. Because again, the flowers are small, you don't notice them. But again, pollinators, whether it be butterflies or, or bees, uh, will actually take these wind pollinated trees too and collect pollen, even though the tree is relying on the wind to pollinate it, the, the bees will still collect it. And willows, are incredibly important. They're one of the first trees to bloom in the spring. Think of your pussy willow. If you've ever noticed how early those bloom in the spring, pussy willow is native to North America. So willows are, are very important. Loving them or hate them, uh, bees, it's, it's critical for bee survival. And then uh, studies have shown, this is a, a grove of bur oak trees. Um, Oh gosh, now the town's escaping me. Roger Welsh's uh, hometown there, uh, Dannenbrog. This is a park in Dannenbrog. And one thing I want you to show, this is the parks of the future, in my opinion, where notice that trees didn't pay attention. They weren't planted 50 foot on center. They're about 10 to 12 feet on center, growing up as a group in a grove. And they don't have a crew coming to mow once a week because the, the shade is so dense, it won't grow grass. The leaves drop, they don't rake them up. It's a nice park, place I'd wanna have a picnic, right? Rather than sunbathed in turf grass and, and the heat and the sun, right? So anyway, these studies have shown 14% of native plants available in a region make up 90% of all the caterpillar species. Why are caterpillars important? Well, let's, we'll find out. So caterpillars will feed on tree leaves. So these butterflies and moths will lay their eggs on these trees and the, the, the trees are always looking for ways to combat that. They have chemical defenses in them. And a lot of times the trees from foreign countries like China or Europe, uh, these chemical defenses are native insects have not learned to overcome, so they won't lay eggs on them. So the common hackberry, for example, uh, this is hackberry, uh, a population of hackberries out in the Pine Ridge near Sydney, Nebraska, as far west as we know it in the world. And just the lowly hackberry alone is the larval food source for these four butterflies. We often think of the monarch and the milkweed, and, but a lot of us haven't learned what are these butterfly larvae feeding on uh, and what is critical for that, us to grow for them to feed on. So when you think of the hackberry, uh, think that it provides food for all four of these beautiful butterflies. So birds will feed their young exclusively on caterpillars. Over 96% of our terrestrial birds uh, are raised on insects, not seeds. So without insects, they're doomed. And caterpillars are really the most essential part for the songbirds to raise their young. They're large, they're, they're high in protein, high in fat and soft. And as uh, Doug Tallamy, who has written uh, several books on the value of native trees, they have a low percentage of chitin. That's like saying, would you feed a baby bird a beetle? That's very, you know, it's got a lot of chitin in it. No, they're feeding them soft insects. So no insects, no baby birds. We have a silent spring. And it's pretty mind boggling. Just a pair of uh, chickadees will feed their youngs between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars before fledging. 
and meeting over 16 days on average, that's pretty amazing, right? And once they fledge, the parents are still feeding these babies, right? So they're still collecting those caterpillars, but nobody's done research to see how much they're still feeding them after they fledge the nest. Spiders are also very important. In fact, uh, we had some wrens uh, use a, a, a birdhouse that we have. You see a picture of a wren here with a, a spider. And so we were able to watch what mom and dad were bringing those babies every day because it was right in our patio. And spiders, uh, just as much as caterpillars, were being brought to the nest. Frogs, toads, amphibians need insects, as do lizards and, and rodents. I don't know about you folks, but I haven't seen a whole lot of toads in the city of Lincoln lately. In fact, I haven't run into a toad in my yard in forever. And the tiger salamanders we used to play with as a kid, non-existent anymore. Even big critters like this, the red foxes that we see around town, up to 25% of their diet is insects. Even black bears, possums, skunks, raccoons, they all rely on insects. So think of your landscape as an insectary. I'm raising insects, not to eat my plants, but to help shore up our nation's biodiversity. And here are the top trees for uh, larval food source. The oak is the king, the quintessential wildlife plant. And there again is that, uh, that park in, uh, in uh, Dannenbrog, Nebraska, beautiful park with lots of bur oaks. Yeah, so it's not only nut forage for a variety of wildlife, other insects and wildlife use oaks for shelter and nesting sites. You'll often see uh, birds working uh, the bark of an oak tree in the wintertime. They're, they're looking for overwintering insects that kind of lay their eggs in the bark. So think of your, your nut hatches that's working up and down uh, an oak or a chickadee. They're looking for those, those eggs that get laid off in those bark crevices. So uh, the caterpillar species that feed on oaks, they don't pupate in the trees, you guys. They fall to the ground when they're fully grown and they burrow into leaf litter, dig themselves under the ground or even chew their way into rotted wood. So if you have a big, beautiful bur oak tree like this one in Gehring and it's just hard packed soil underneath it, tidied up every fall, uh, raking the leaves and getting rid of them, it's, it's like a food desert still. So the oak is not gonna provide the same benefits unless you create a landscape underneath that tree. Uh, so all, when those leaves drop, you're not so intent on raking them away. And if you put in native shrubs, woodland sedges or flowers like wild ginger, Solomon seal, woodland phlox, that leaf litter just kind of moves in around and the plants come right up through it. So, that those beneficial insects, it's critical that they overwinter in that leaf mulch. And I'll use a good example. Everybody loves fireflies. Fireflies are a beetle. And all you have to go do is drive around Lincoln during firefly season to an older neighborhood where they have big trees and they're not so particular about uh, removing every last leaf. You'll often see more fireflies in those older neighborhoods than you will in new developments. And that's because of the leaf litter. That's where they're overwintering. So to increase nesting habitat for, for our beneficial insects and native bees, and native bees, everybody wants to help now, 70% of our native bees nest on the ground. So when we're mulching, you can see this community project here, everybody's proud of putting down all this mulch, but they put this weed barrier underneath, there's no interaction between the soil uh, and the wood chips. So you're not building the soil by adding the wood chips over that, that landscape fabric barrier. So we don't recommend putting that down. Right, Sarah? Right, yeah, definitely. Just put the mulch right onto the bare ground and the mulch will break down, but it's supposed to, and it'll add organic matter to the soil, but it creates much better habitat for those nesting bees. And so, you also wanna keep the mulch fairly shallow for the nesting bees. If you put a really heavy mulch layer on, you know, four inches or so, that could be prohibitive for bee nesting. So if you wanna uh, uh, promote the pollinators, you might wanna go with, you know, a shallower layer, an inch or maybe two inches max. That's right. Yeah, here's a, a good example of people think they can't mulch with leaves because it looks too messy. I think that looks pretty uniform and attractive to me. And, mm -hmm. and you know you've arrived. Uh, I, I use a lot of tree mulch at home, don't rake a lot of my leaves. I keep my curb edge clean and that's how you'll keep your neighbors happy. So they're not looking at your place going, what's with this dude? He never rakes his leaves. 
Well, if you keep your curb edge clean, they're not going to yell at you because once right. they set in place, they don't blow around. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I've seen a bumblebee hovering over, kind of doing a dance back and forth above the leaves. And then it kind of landed on the leaves and crawled in. I knew I had arrived for bumblebee habitat because it was basically crawling underneath the leaves into its hole that it made in the ground to make its nest. Nice. So we need to be a little less tidy. We need to not be quite as tidy as, as we sometimes are, are uh, tempted to be. Right. Yeah, here's, here's a good example. Expectations for growth. People don't plant oak trees, they feel, because they're too slow growing. This is a linden tree on the left and an oak on the right planted around the same time. One you can see was planted near a Walmart. Another one in a neighborhood, you see the size of the mulch ring. One is maybe six feet wide, one's maybe three feet wide. This person went back and checked on the growth rate of these trees. So you can say, I want a fast growing tree. Well, you can throw that out the window if you plant a tree that's really large. You can throw that out the window if you if you improperly plant the tree or if you don't take care of that tree after planting, right? You can throw a growth rate out the window. So if you show the next slide, this person actually measured, you can see how, how much a tree grows by looking at the bud leaf scars. So you can see that three and a half inches is what that linden averaged per year over five years. And that swamp white oak averaged 27 inches a year over that five inch span, which is pretty impressive. So there you can see what's called the scars left by the terminal bud scales. So everybody can look at a tree and see how much it grew uh, last year or this year's growth, the one year growth or the year before. You can often look at this growth rate and say, hey, you must have had a drought last year without even knowing if there was a drought or not. You can look and see just how much that tree uh, grew in, in, that, uh, in that time period. So here's a tree planted in a parking island. Uh, oftentimes I see this happen and I, I see the turf grass there. And now, now somebody, some poor person that takes care of it has got to hop this curb and mow it once a week. Why not just eliminate all that grass and make it a, a mulch so the tree kind of owns the space and you don't have that grass competition. Uh, here's the tree, a picture of it taken in 2000. Same tree, picture taken in 2005. See how fast it's growing? <laughs> Actually, more like it's dying slowly. So here's some trees planted in a parking island. Everything looks right, properly planted tree. But then when you go and inspect it a little closer, oh, and pull the mulch back, they didn't even take the, the, the rope off that was around the trunk. The, as the tree's trying to grow and expand, that rope will eventually girdle that tree and kill it. So that's got to be removed. And you can see that saw down there or this, this probe there, there, this person was probing down once they removed all the ropes and found out this tree was planted too deep as well. They could not find any of the top roots of that tree. Uh, the probe went down a solid six inches or more before they found the first set of roots. So planting depth is critical. So this tree had a lot of things going against it yeah. um, uh, as far as being a long-term healthy tree. And the reason that those are often planted that way is time is money. And right. I'm sorry, a professionally planted tree, my kid could have done a better job. A professionally right. planted tree isn't just digging a hole and sticking it in the ground. You know, uh, we got to we got to do it right. Right. That's why I like to plant my trees myself, because, you know, unfortunately, uh, nurseries do the best they can as far as hiring staff. But the staff that they hire for the summer are just temporary workers. They don't have any special knowledge about trees or tree planting. And they're trying to get the job done as quickly as they can so they can get on to the next the next job. So, um, you know, they oftentimes this is very common to, to run into a situation like this when you hire a nursery to plant a tree for you. So we're going to segue just a little bit to talk about climate change and what's happening in Nebraska related to climate change. And basically what we're seeing is we're seeing more temperature extremes, prolonged drought, some exceptional moisture events, and all of these things come together to mean that we need to start, we need to be choosing trees that are, are very tolerant to all of these extremes. Um, you know, people ask me, well, climate change is gonna make Nebraska warmer, so I, can I start planting trees that are, that are uh, winter hardy in zone six? And I say, no, you know, no, you need to plant trees that are more hardy, not less hardy. So just to give you an idea of some temperature swings, I put some, some uh, uh, data up here together for you. So early last year, uh, between February 16th and March 9th, 
we had 101 degree temperature difference in a matter of four weeks. Wow. Okay. Um, so think about that. I mean, we went from minus 31 to 77 degrees <laughs> in, in four weeks. Wow. Um, now the, the going up is not quite so hard. It's the going down, which is a little bit harder on our, our plants. Um, if you look at the numbers for fall, you know, uh, in November, uh, we had a 53 degree difference in just a matter of about a week. We went from 75 to minus 22. Mm. So, or excuse me, 75 to 22 degrees. Okay. Um, and that's, we, we run into these situations in the fall where trees, it's been warm, it's been abnormally warm going late into the fall, into November. And then all of a sudden we get a big temperature drop and we have some very cold night temperatures. And if trees are not properly hardened off at that point, they can be damaged by those cold temperatures. And we have seen um, significant evidence of that with, with trees being dead in the spring and people not understanding why. Um, prolonged drought and periodic drought is another um, situation that we're going to run into with climate change. And so I just did a quick breakdown of what our rainfall has been for this for last year, for 2021. And if you look all the way to the bottom, you can see the total is not too far off normal. So normal for us would be about 28.16 inches. Right as of December 31st, we were at 26.86 inches. So that's only about an inch and a third off of normal. But if you look at um, some of these months, you'll realize that we're getting these heavy rainfalls that come all in one 24 hour period where so much water is coming down that it, there, it can't soak into the soil. And so then it runs off. And so that, that moisture is really lost to our plants. It's not available for our plants for their growth and their health. Um, uh, and I just put up a, a list there of some of the drought years that we've had in the, 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 the um, the most intense drought years we've had in the last, or the most intense 10 years of drought that we've had since um, data has been recorded. Wow. So drought is an ongoing, is a, uh, an environmental situation that has ongoing impact on our trees because of all of these physiological things that I've listed for you on the screen. Um, and when, when roots start to die and when soil mycorrhizae start to die, it takes a while for those things to grow back before the tree can fully recover from that damage. So there's a, there's a definite lag in recovery on the trees. And if the trees are hit again and again with environmental situations like this, it can put them in a, in a position where they can't recover fully and then they just start a downward spiral and the tree just doesn't recover, mm -hmm. okay? So again, a little bit of data from this summer. Um, in March, we had a rain of a five plus inch rainfall on March 14th. Um, in June, we had, um, um, oh, excuse me, excuse me, I read that wrong. So on March 14th, we had um, 2.97 inches of rain on that one day. Um, total rain for March was 5.23 inches. In June, we had three fairly heavy events where we got an inch or more of rain at a time. And then in August, we had a couple of, of fairly heavy events as well. But we all know that flooding is becoming more of an issue. We've had three big floods in the last, um, what would that be, the last 30 years. Um, so uh, flooding, periodic flooding is another consequence of climate change that we're facing. Yeah, no, and I think related to sort of climate change and the extremes, trees are more important than ever. Um, and a spot that's getting hit really hard is, especially like in our community and communities across the world actually, um, are suffering from heat island effects scenarios where maybe there were trees or there never were trees and they're coming out. Um, so something that uh, Parks and Rec in the city of Lincoln is starting to do is this grant funding program um, with the Nebraska Forest Service to help low and moderate income homeowners. Um, so like if you look at this picture, let's say it's an old neighborhood with large established trees, removing a tree due to a weather event can be super costly. Um, and this grant program helps to remove and replant those trees at no cost. So if you're interested in more information about that, you can look it up on our website. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it's just really important as we touched on earlier, trees play a huge role in not only the ecological benefits, um, 
but also the socioeconomical benefits as well. Um, people like trees. Trees make people happy. They're good for the environment. Um, and they help combat these, these drastic uh, climate changes with drought and, um, yeah. Right, right, right. So um, maybe I'll just pause here for a moment and, and ask Lori. Um, I, I realize that we're, we're already over our time frame. It's, it's <laughs> almost 10 after 8. Um, we have some information about tree planting and care. What would you like us to do? Would you like to um, just have a stop here and take a few questions or what would be your preference? Um, Sarah, how much of your program do you estimate you have left? We still could probably go for at least another half an hour, 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, could we ask you to um, provide maybe just a few of the the even if it ask you to zip through a few of your slides and hit some of the most important points about um, site selection, planting, early care. Okay, you yeah. can and, do that. And I, you know, just kind of keeping an eye on the questions, I think you're doing a pretty good job of covering them really. Um, and we can mention one or two quick things at the end. So let's, let's see if you could uh, zip along and maybe in the next, uh, you know, five, 10 minutes, uh, we'll wrap it up. We'll wrap it up. Okay. All right. Challenge okay. accepted. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Caitlin, you want to talk about site selection? Yes. So let's say you have your yard. I think something you need to think about first before you start meandering at a nursery daydreaming, I think you need to plan. Um, coming from the park planner, think about what your purpose is for your landscaping. So let's say you don't want to see your neighbor's house. You want to have a screen. Um, look for evergreens. Um, let's say you want to have a statement piece in the front of your house. Look for something small like a service berry. Um, so just really do your research and figure out exactly where you want to put something. Um, I also like uh, using white spray paint on, on my lawn um, to kind of test where I think I want something. I think that's a good um, kind of visualization to help you think about what it would look like there. Um, and then once you decide where you want something, look into what tree you're picking. Um, I'm showing Northern Catalpa on here on the right. This was from our tree giveaway from this last May, um, our tr well, last, last October is our trigger tree, but um, it kind of gives information about the tree. So again, look up, look up the tree, understand it's full growth. You know, when you buy it, it's small, but fully grown, 70 feet tall and 50 feet wide. Like you need to make sure you're um, picking the right spot for that. So I wouldn't put it close to your house. Um, and also, most importantly, call 811 before you dig. I think that's an overlooked step. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things underground that we don't know about. Um, so that's really important. Yes. Um, yeah, and that's um, related to that. Go for it, Sarah. Yeah, so site selection really is important. And, um, you know, I, Bob, I, you wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that trees prefer to grow in groups rather than singly as individuals in a landscape. Yeah, you saw that poor tree planted all by its lonesome in that field of grass, you know, going, where's my buddies, right? And, mm -hmm. and actually, the, the root systems of those trees will kind of graft to each other and kind of help each other along. On the left, you see this is a grove of ginkgo trees uh, growing at Arbor Lodge. If you've ever visited Arbor Lodge, they have a little trail near the, the mansion. And there's a grove of ginkgos that was probably planted by Jay Sterling Morton himself. And these, these trees are probably only about 10 feet apart. And I've asked the person that takes care of it, he said he's never had to prune them. So there's the top canopy of those ginkgos. Uh, they're occupying the same amount of space. They, we would typically plant just one tree. And then the other one was a grove of burr oaks there. Here again, uh, you can see how close these trunks are together where we would typically just plant one tree. There's about eight of them in here and all happily getting along with an arborist crew coming in and, and pruning them. Yeah, uh, again, this is uh, my sister's landscape. As an example, you don't want to just plant your tree in the middle of your lawn. Use your landscape to your advantage and plant stuff together. They like, they like to be together. Yeah, um, and put it, putting it into a landscape bed, as you see in this landscape, rather than a tree in the middle of a lawn, mm -hmm. um, has a lot of benefits. You don't, you don't have to mow around each individual tree. You protect the trees from mower damage and stream trimmer damage. You make it easier to water because you can water the plants in the bed similarly and you water the turf separately. It makes mowing easier because you can just mow along the edge of the bed instead of around each individual plant. 
So there's, exactly. there's lots of benefits to grouping plants together in beds rather than, you know, putting a tree individually by itself in a lawn. No doubt. Yep. Okay. And look at that huge mulch bed that tree gets to take advantage of. This is actually a picture on yeah. East Campus. And I, I love this picture because it has the big overstory trees growing and then some understory trees like serviceberry and crab apples. And then finally a shrub border under that. So it's, it's, it's a cool uh, example of what you can do rather than just pine trees for screening. You can layer these things in there for, to screen something, even though they're deciduous. All those leaves that drop off the trees, the understory and the shrubs don't have to be raked up. They can just right. kind of hide in that landscape bed. Right. So we wanted to talk a little bit about plant timing. And, you know, um, a lot of people still think that spring is really the best time to plant, but um, spring is kind of, in my mind, it's the second best time to plant. The best yeah. time to plant trees is really in the fall. And Bob, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. You know, fall, you know, in the spring, you know, oftentimes with climate change, especially as you know, spring seem to be coming sooner where we'll be, we can get 90 degrees in April. So the tree has a lot of demands on it. If you're planting it in April, it's trying to grow new leaves while it's trying to go roots at the same time. Whereas if you plant in the fall, a lot of that root growth is taking place in cooler soil, meaning you can gain some time in October, November, and then gain more time in, in late February in, in all throughout the month of March that you're not going to get by planting that tree in April or May. So a lot more root growth is gonna take place by doing a fall planted tree. And the water demands are much less because the weather's getting cooler rather than getting hotter. So it's just a, a, a much better time of year to be planting trees. Right, definitely. And other landscape plants as well. Right, exactly. Right, yeah. right. Um, it can also be a good idea, um, especially with like evergreens, um, you know, evergreens, since they hold their needles all, all winter long, are more, more prone to winter burn, where they're not pulling up enough water in the winter months, and they come into spring, and then you see some browning or some desiccation. Um, so, you know, you can, you can do fall planting, but then you have to make sure that those trees have plenty of water and that they stay well, well hydrated in comparison to this fall. This, this has been an extremely dry winter. I mean, we've had two tiny little snowstorms. Right. Um, we have had pr practically no rain at all in October, November, December. So yeah. we're having an extremely dry winter. Um, and with evergreens, you need to make sure that they stay watered, especially if it's newly planted and it's not, uh, maybe may not be well established to make sure that you don't have anything like desiccation happening on that tree in the winter months. Amen, Sarah. What I like to say is if you're doing evergreens in the fall, do it early fall rather than late fall. Whereas if you're doing a deciduous tree, we like to plant them when they're dormant, when they actually lose their leaves already, and it just looks like you're planting a bare stick. Um, that's the best time to plant that. But evergreen early in the fall, i.e., you know, late September, so they have time to put on some root growth before the soil does freeze. Right. Well, how about if we um, we talk a little bit? Let's skip over a few of these and talk about um, um, care, tree care. And um, I guess this would be a good place to stop on this slide or to stop here and talk a little bit about um, creating a good environment for the, the, the tree to grow. And we've touched on these things, a lot, a lot of them already. We've talked about establishing that litter layer um, and creating a good vigorous uh, um, soil environment for the, the tree's roots to grow well. Um, Avoid making sure you avoid root damage if, if possible, planting it right. And that goes back to site selection many times, making sure that you have the tree sited well in a good location, um, avoiding grass competition because grass is actually quite competitive for nutrients and water and can really um, hinder a tree growth. Um, make sure that you're managing the nutrients and match the tree to the site. So um, these are all good ways that you can go about creating a good environment for that tree uh, to grow well. And so um, I'll skip over a few of those and let's talk a little bit about watering and care for new trees and how to get that tree doing well once we've got it in the ground. Um, so you guys want to talk a little bit about watering for new trees? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I heard Dr. John Ball with this quote in the middle, it's more important how you, often you water, meaning the frequency 
versus the duration. If you if you uh, are watering a tree, oftentimes we'll say, you know, an inch of water a week or whatever. What does that exactly mean, right? So if you think of the, the amount of water in, in terms of buckets, a lot of us can picture a five gallon bucket versus I laid the hose down for 20 minutes, right? So uh, watering that tree twice a week with a five gallon bucket of water versus one time a week with 10 gallons of water, that's what we mean by that. Because a lot of times what we're seeing is people overwatering their trees, relying on their sprinkling system to establish the tree. And oftentimes that drowns the tree within that turf area. So think more about frequency, how often you water it, uh, more frequency, less duration. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um. Yeah, that's just kind of some good general rules, five to 10 gallons of water. So basically two five gallon buckets you say I have a two inch caliper tree, I'll, I'll water it with a five gallon bucket of water. And often that's enough to soak up that root ball and the soil around it, maybe two five gallon buckets. So if you do it by buckets rather than a hose, you're never gonna overwater your tree because you know how much you're putting down. Right, and something that we do at the city, uh, since we don't necessarily carry on buckets of water, <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, we have we have tree bags. I don't know if you guys have yeah. much experience using tree bags, but it's like a slow watering system um, that we fill up with our water trucks. But it's another way to get that slow release of water into the the root zone. Okay. Right. Yeah. You guys want to just? Um, I'm going to skip ahead to um, some of Kaylin's slides about the city uh, city forestry programs. Yes. Is there any any other comments you want to make to folks about um, maintaining trees and making sure? Well, here, I'll just stop here real briefly and show there's a picture of the tree bags that Kaylin is talking about yes. yep. that they yep. use to make sure their trees stay watered. Yeah, and I actually found this video on YouTube. It's She's using a bucket, but she's dumping it on the back of a shovel. So it's not necessarily uh -huh. hitting the soil. It's like, oh, that's brilliant. I've never done that before. Right. <laughs> so it's like, I'm going to share it with everybody here. So anyway. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then that keeping the trees, older trees healthy, it's just establishing or, or expanding that mulch zone, right, to the drip mm -hmm. line. And then you can keep those old. In other words, rather than just putting a little bit of mulch around each tree like you saw there, why not incorporate it into one big mulch bed? Exactly. Right. And the one thing we want to stay away with with mulching, a big, um, big don't on the mulch, is don't pile mulch up against the trunk of the trees. It leads to bark rots, holds moisture against the bark, and leads to bark rots. It also creates the perfect environment for voles to get in there and do damage, especially to the bark of young trees. So your bark, your mulch should be a flat layer. It should be flat like a pancake, not like a volcano up against yeah. the trunk of your tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Kaylin, do you want to just kind of close us out here and talk a little bit about some of the community um, tree programs that are going on with Lincoln Parks and Rec? Sure. Yeah, no, I definitely wanted to touch on this too, because I know maybe maybe you don't have a landscape where you can plant trees or maybe you were, your landscape is already full of trees. Um, there are many ways you can contribute to the community tree canopy, um, either through do donations or even different programs that we have at Parks and Rec and the Lincoln Parks Foundation. Um, Lincoln Parks Foundation, you can donate money for trees. Two for Trees is a program I'm sure most of you are familiar with about adding the, the $2 to your electric bill, I believe. Um, we also have an adopt an ash program. Uh, it's free of cost, but if you know of an ash that you would like to adopt that meets our requirements to be treated, um, we can treat it. So again, do some searching on the lincoln.ne.gov website and you'll be able to find all of these um, programs in there. Um, I already touched on the pilot program about low and moderate, low and moderate income neighborhoods. Um, pray, Prairie pruners will be something with Faith to Forest, I think, next presentation. Um, but it's kind of about learning how to prune um, trees as like citizen tree pr pruners. Um, and Lori Gruber will be able to talk about that more. She's our community forester. Um, and then we also have lots of volunteer opportunities within our parks. And you can click to the next slide. Um, so if you know of a park like in your neighborhood that you want to have trees, you can contact us and we can help you coordinate a planting event. Um, this planting event again was at Jensen Park with the Arbor Day Foundation. Um, we planted, I think like 75 trees in like an hour and a half. So we do a quick planting demonstration and then we kind of let them loose. Um, they help us plant the trees and mulch the trees and help prep them. Um, 
so this is an example of another planting volunteer event that we did where, um, you know, we had a set amount of trees that we needed to use. And then I kind of helped coordinate the volunteer planting event by showing people where to park and where to meet. Um, so it's pretty fun and pretty easy. So if you have like a neighborhood association that wants to do something like this, it's very possible. Um, and there's some pictures from that, that planting plan that you just saw, um, again, with the Arbor Day Foundation. And there's their families. Uh, what's cool about that is it brings people together. That's what I like about it is it, it, it gives you that community spirit, that community pride. Yes, yes. And if uh, maybe you can't plant trees, we also need a lot of help taking care of the trees that we already have. Um, I think people really want to plant trees and love like the symbology of planting trees, but what we also need help with is caring for trees. Um, so this was an event that I did with the, the Rotary Club where they wanted to come and mulch the trees. Um, and again, it was like an hour and it was super easy and quick. And I think, again, it brought people together and helps provide ownership to our, our pub public assets. So definitely. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we, we did go a little bit long and I apologize to everybody on that. Um, what I could do though is to make the um, a handout available of the entire presentation uh, to Lori. And then if she wants to distribute it to um, the participants, you'll have a chance to look through it and, and read some of the things that we might have skipped over a little bit too quickly there. Um, but if you'd like to contact any of us, um, you can see here the emails for, for Bob, Kaylin, and I, and um, you can certainly get in touch with us. And uh, I'm sure we'd ha be happy to answer any questions that you might have that we didn't get a chance to answer for you tonight. And Lynn's been doing a great job of answering the questions in the chat. So good work, Lynn. Great, great. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you. Um, a, a huge thank you to our panelists. That was that was absolutely wonderful. Um, and yes, Sarah, we have had some requests in the chat to um, have your, your slides set and, and notes or whatever you can share. Um, we'll get those added to our uh, Faith the Forest web pages uh, and in the next few days, hopefully. Uh, so check check back for that. So a few quick things in addition to thanking our, our panelists. Um, as mentioned, we do have recordings of, of there'll be a recording of this, this presentation as well as the prior ones are on our web pages. Um, and I, I put the uh, web link in the chat. Uh, the uh, thanks, a big thanks to Judy Greenwald with the First Plymouth climate action team who pulled together the panel and brainstormed with them what the contents of the presentation could be. So thank you, Judy. A uh, quick preview next week, as Kaylin mentioned, is going to be an introduction to Prairie Pruners. And then the week after that, our, our last uh, uh, Thursday night Zoom will be uh, Pat Leach, the director of Lincoln City Libraries and Martha Shulsky, the state climatologist, talking about our Faith of Forest a uh, community read book, which is called The Future We Choose, uh, A Stubborn Optimist Guide to the Climate Crisis. And the two of them will be talking about the book and uh, it, it will be, a, uh, I think, a nice presentation. So you'll, you'll want to tune in for that. You can get um, all the details about Prairie Pruners and the, uh, the book that we're going to be reading on, again, on our uh, website. So take a look there. And then uh, something we asked the 28 participating faith communities and faith the forest to do was to have a special service sometime this year. Um, and there are two tree Sabbaths coming up this Sunday, one at First Baptist Church in Lincoln and one at Westminster Presbyterian. And then on June 30th, the Unitarian Church and First Plymouth Church will be having uh, special services. And Lincoln Friends Meeting is going to be discussing the future we choose, the book I mentioned, um, over the next uh, over the next several meetings. Um, that is what we have for some some quick announcements. So again, a big thank you to our presenters for this evening, and we will look forward to seeing uh, everyone back here next week. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>